This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. The Antichrist by Friedrich Nietzsche. Sections 48 through 53. 48. Has any one ever clearly understood the celebrated story at the beginning of the Bible, of God's mortal terror of science? No one, in fact, has understood it. This priest-book par excellence opens, as is fitting, with the great inner difficulty of the priest. He faces only one great danger. Ergo, God faces only one great danger. The old God, Holy Spirit, Holy the High Priest, Holy Perfect, is promenading his garden. He is bored, and trying to kill time. Against boredom even gods struggle in vain. What does he do? He creates man. Man is entertaining. But then he notices that man is also bored. God's pity for the only form of distress that invades all paradises knows no bounds, so he forthwith creates other animals. God's first mistake. To man, these other animals were not entertaining. He sought dominion over them. He did not want to be an animal himself. So God created woman. In the act he brought boredom to an end, and also many other things. Woman was the second mistake of God. Woman, at bottom, is a serpent, Heva. Every priest knows that. From woman comes every evil in the world. Every priest knows that, too. Ergo, she also is to blame for science. It was through woman that man learned to taste of the tree of knowledge. What happened? The old god was seized by mortal terror. Man himself had been his greatest blunder. He had created a rival to himself. Science makes men godlike. It is all up with priests and gods when man becomes scientific. Moral. Science is the forbidden, per se. It alone is forbidden. Science is the first of sins, the germ of all sins, the original sin. This is all there is of morality. Thou shalt not know. The rest follows from that. God's mortal terror, however, did not hinder him from being shrewd. How is one to protect oneself against science? For a long while this was the capital problem. Answer, out of paradise with man. Happiness, leisure, foster thought— and all thoughts are bad thoughts. Man must not think. And so the priest invents distress, death, the mortal dangers of childbirth, all sorts of misery, old age, decrepitude, above all sickness, nothing but devices for making war on science. The troubles of man don't allow him to think. Nevertheless, how terrible! The edifice of knowledge begins to tower aloft, invading heaven, shadowing the gods. What is to be done? The old god invents war. He separates the peoples. He makes men destroy one another. The priests have always had need of war. War, among other things, a great disturber of science. Incredible. Knowledge, deliverance from the priests, prospers in spite of war. So the old god comes to his final resolution. Man has become scientific. There is no help for it. He must be drowned. 49. I have been understood. At the opening of the Bible there is the whole psychology of the priest. The priest knows of only one great danger, that is, science, the sound comprehension of cause and effect. But science flourishes. On the whole, only under favorable conditions. A man must have time. He must have an overflowing intellect in order to know. Therefore man must be made unhappy. This has been, in all ages, the logic of the priest. It is easy to see just what, by this logic, was the first thing to come into the world. Sin. The concept of guilt and punishment, the whole moral order of the world, was set up against science, against the deliverance of man from priests. Man must not look outward, he must look inward. He must not look at things shrewdly and cautiously to learn about them. He must not look at all. He must suffer, and he must suffer so much that he is always in need of the priest. Away with physicians! What is needed is a saviour. 
the concept of guilt and punishment, including the doctrines of grace, of salvation, of forgiveness, lies through and through, and absolutely without psychological reality, were devised to destroy man's sense of causality. They are an attack upon the concept of cause and effect, and not an attack with the fist, with the knife, with honesty and hate and love. On the contrary, one inspired by the most cowardly, the most crafty, the most ignoble of instincts. An attack of priests, an attack of parasites, the vampirism of pale subterranean leeches, when the natural consequences of an act are no longer natural, but are regarded as produced by the ghostly creations of superstition, by God, by spirits, by souls, and reckoned as merely moral consequences, as rewards, as punishments, as hints, as lessons, then the whole groundwork of knowledge is destroyed. Then the greatest of crimes against humanity has been perpetrated. I repeat that sin, man's self-desecration par excellence, was invented in order to make science, culture, and every elevation and ennobling of man impossible. The priest rules through the invention of sin. 50. In this place I can't permit myself to omit a psychology of belief, of the believer, for the special benefit of believers. If there remain any today who do not yet know how indecent it is to be believing, or how much a sign of decadence, of a broken will to live, then they will know it well enough tomorrow. My voice reaches even the deaf. It appears, unless I have been incorrectly informed, that there prevails among Christians a sort of criterion of truth that is called proof by power. Faith makes blessed, therefore it is true. It might be objected right here that blessedness is not demonstrated. It is merely promised. It hangs upon faith as a condition. One shall be blessed because one believes. But what of the thing that the priest promises to the believer? the holy transcendental beyond. How is that to be demonstrated? The proof by power, thus assumed, is actually no more at bottom than a belief that the effects which faith promises will not fail to appear. In a formula, I believe that faith makes for blessedness, therefore it is true. But this is as far as we may go. This therefore would be absurdum itself as a criterion of truth. But let us admit, for the sake of politeness, that blessedness by faith may be demonstrated, not merely hoped for, and not merely promised by the suspicious lips of a priest. Even so, could blessedness, in a technical term pleasure, ever be a proof of truth? So little is this true that it is almost a proof against truth when sensations of pleasure influence the answer to the question, what is true? or at all events, it is enough to make that truth highly suspicious. The proof by pleasure is a proof of pleasure. Nothing more. Why in the world should it be assumed that true judgments give more pleasure than false ones, and that, in conformity to some pre-established harmony, they necessarily bring agreeable feelings in their train? The experience of all disciplined and profound minds teaches the contrary. Man has had to fight for every atom of the truth, and has had to pay for it almost everything that the heart, that human love, that human trust, cling to. Greatness of soul is needed for this business. The service of truth is the hardest of all services. What then is the meaning of integrity in things intellectual? It means that a man must be severe with his own heart, that he must scorn beautiful feelings, and that he makes every yea and nay a matter of conscience. Faith makes blessed, therefore it lies. 51. The fact that faith, under certain circumstances, may work for blessedness, but that this blessedness is produced by an idea fixe, by no means makes the idea itself true, and the fact that faith actually moves no mountains, but instead raises them up where there were none before, all this is made sufficiently clear by a walk through a lunatic asylum. Not, of course, to a priest, for his instincts prompt him to the lie that sickness is not sickness, and lunatic asylums not lunatic asylums. Christianity finds sickness necessary, 
just as the Greek spirit had need of a superabundance of health. The actual ulterior motive of the whole system of salvation of the Church is to make people ill. And the Church itself. Doesn't it set up a Catholic lunatic asylum as the ultimate ideal? The whole earth as a madhouse? The sort of religious man that the Church wants is a typical decadent. The moment at which a religious crisis dominates a people is always marked by epidemics of nervous disorder. The inner world of the religious man is so much like the inner world of the overstrung and exhausted that it is difficult to distinguish between them. The highest states of mind, held up before mankind by Christianity as of supreme worth, are actually epileptoid in form. The Church has granted the name of holy only to lunatics or to gigantic frauds, in majorum dei honorum. Once I ventured to designate the whole Christian system of training in penance and salvation, now best studied in England, as a method of producing a folie circulaire upon a soil already prepared for it, which is to say, a soil thoroughly unhealthy. Not every one may be a Christian. One is not converted to Christianity. One must first be sick enough for it. We others, who have the courage for health and likewise for contempt, we may well despise a religion that teaches misunderstanding of the body, that refuses to rid itself of superstition about the soul, that makes a virtue of insufficient nourishment, that combats health as a sort of enemy, devil, temptation, that persuades itself that it is possible to carry about a perfect soul in a cadaver of a body, and that to this end had to devise for itself a new concept of perfection, a pale, sickly, idiotically ecstatic state of existence, so-called holiness, a holiness that is itself merely a series of symptoms of an impoverished, enervated, and incurably disordered body. The Christian movement, as a European movement, was from the start no more than a general uprising of all sorts of outcast and refuse elements, who now, under cover of Christianity, aspire to power. It does not represent the decay of a race. It represents, on the contrary, a conglomeration of decadence products from all direction, crowding together and seeking one another out. It was not, as has been thought, the corruption of antiquity, of noble antiquity, which made Christianity possible. One cannot too sharply challenge the learned imbecility which today maintains that theory. At the time when the sick and rotten Chandala classes in the whole imperium were Christianized, the contrary type, the nobility, reached its finest and ripest development. The majority became master. Democracy, with its Christian instincts, triumphed. Christianity was not national. It was not based on race. It applied to all the varieties of men disinherited by life. It had its allies everywhere. Christianity has the rancor of the sick at its very core, the instinct against the healthy, against health. Everything that is well constituted, proud, gallant, and above all beautiful gives offense to its ears and eyes. Again I remind you of Paul's priceless saying, And God hath chosen the weak things of the world, the foolish things of the world, the base things of the world, and things which are despised. 1 Corinthians 1, 27-28 This was the formula. In hoc signo, the decadence triumphed. God on the cross. Is man always to miss the frightful inner significance of this symbol? Everything that suffers, everything that hangs on the cross, is divine. We all hang on the cross. Consequently, we are divine. We alone are divine. Christianity was thus a victory. A nobler attitude of mind was destroyed by it. Christianity remains to this day the greatest misfortune of humanity. 52. Christianity also stands in opposition to all intellectual well-being. Sick reasoning is the only sort that it can use as Christian reasoning. It takes the side of everything that is idiotic. It pronounces a curse upon intellect upon the superbia of the healthy intellect. Since sickness is inherent in Christianity, it follows that the typically Christian state of faith must be a form of sickness too, and that all straight, 
straightforward and scientific paths to knowledge must be banned by the church as forbidden ways. Doubt is thus a sin from the start. The complete lack of psychological cleanliness in the priest, revealed by a glance at him, is a phenomenon resulting from decadence. One may observe in hysterical women and in rachitic children how regularly the falsification of instincts, delight in lying for the mere sake of lying, and incapacity for looking straight and walking straight are symptoms of decadence. Faith means the will to avoid knowing what is true. The pietist, the priest of either sex, is a fraud because he is sick. His instinct demands that the truth shall never be allowed its rights on any point. Whatever makes for illness is good, whatever issues from abundance, from superabundance, from power, is evil. So argues the believer. The impulse to lie. It is by this that I recognize every foreordained theologian. Another characteristic of the theologian is his unfitness for philology. What I mean here by philology is, in a general sense, the art of reading with profit, the capacity for absorbing facts without interpreting them falsely, and without losing caution, patience, and subtlety in the effort to understand them. Philology as effexis, that is, skepticism in interpretation, whether one be dealing with books, with newspaper reports, with the most fateful events, or with weather statistics, not to mention the salvation of the soul. The way in which a theologian, whether in Berlin or in Rome, is ready to explain, say, a passage of scripture, or an experience, or a victory by the national army, by turning upon it the high illumination of the Psalms of David, is always so daring that it is enough to make a philologian run up a wall. But what shall he do when pietists and other such cows from Suabia use the finger of God to convert their miserably commonplace and hugger-mugger existence into a miracle of grace, a providence, and an experience of salvation? The most modest exercise of the intellect, not to say of decency, should certainly be enough to convince these interpreters of the perfect childishness and unworthiness of such a misuse of the divine digital dexterity. However small our piety, if we ever encountered a God who always cured us of a cold in the head just at the right time, or got us into our carriage at the very instant heavy rain began to fall, he would seem so absurd a God that he'd have to be abolished even if he existed. God as a domestic servant, as a letter-carrier, as an almanac-man, at bottom, he is a mere name for the stupidest sort of chance. Divine Providence which every third man in educated Germany still believes in, is so strong an argument against God that it would be impossible to think of a stronger. And in any case it is an argument against Germans. 53. It is so little true that martyrs offer any support to the truth of a cause that I am inclined to deny that any martyr has ever had anything to do with the truth at all. In the very tone in which a martyr flings what he fancies to be true at the head of the world, there appears so low a grade of intellectual honesty, and such insensibility to the problem of truth, that it is never necessary to refute him. Truth is not something that one man has, and another man has not. At best, only peasants, or peasant apostles like Luther, can think of truth in any such way. One may rest assured that the greater the degree of a man's intellectual conscience, the greater will be his modesty, his discretion, on this point. To know in five cases, and to refuse with delicacy to know anything further, truth, as the word is understood by every prophet, every sectarian, every freethinker, every socialist, and every churchman, is simply a complete proof that not even a beginning has been made in the intellectual discipline and self-control that are necessary to the unearthing of even the smallest truth. The deaths of the martyrs, it may be said in passing, have been the misfortunes of history. They have misled. The conclusion that all idiots, women, and plebeians come to, that there must be something in a cause for which any one goes to his death, or which, as under primitive Christianity, sets off epidemics of death-seeking. This conclusion has been an unspeakable drag upon the testing of facts, upon the whole spirit of inquiry and investigation. The martyrs have damaged the truth. 
Even to this day the crude fact of persecution is enough to give an honourable name to the most empty sort of sectarianism. But why? Is the worth of a cause altered by the fact that someone had laid down his life for it? An error that becomes honourable is simply an error that has acquired one seductive charm more. Do you suppose, Messrs. Theologians, that we shall give you the chance to be martyred for your lies? One best disposes of a cause by respectfully putting it on ice. That is also the best way to dispose of theologians. This was precisely the world-historical stupidity of all the persecutors, that they gave the appearance of honour to the cause they opposed, that they made it a present of the fascination of martyrdom. Women are still on their knees before an error because they have been told that someone died on the cross for it. Is the cross then an argument? But about all these things there is one, and one only, who has said what has been needed for thousands of years. Zarathustra. They made signs in blood along the way that they went, and their folly taught them that the truth is proved by blood. But blood is the worst of all testimonies to the truth. Blood poisoneth even the purest teaching, and turneth it into madness and hatred in the heart. And when one goeth through fire for his teaching, what doth that prove? Verily it is more when one's teaching cometh out of one's own burning. End of sections 48 through 53